Hello, everyone. Um, I'm Christy Oliver, the Professional Development Manager at Davis Publications. Thank you all so much for joining us this afternoon. Today, we are thrilled to have a fantastic panel of Art 21 educators to share their wisdom about incorporating contemporary art into high school art classes. We'll hear from the panel in just a minute, but before we do, I'd also like to introduce Emma Nordine, Manager of Education Initiatives at Art 21, who will also be moderating this session. So in addition to the panelists, you'll be hearing myself and Emma throughout the session today. A few quick housekeeping items before we begin. We'd love for you to ask questions throughout our time together. The best way to do that is to type your questions into the chat box or to use the Q&A button. Both can be found at the bottom of your screen. We'll be monitoring these throughout the session and we'll get to as many questions as we can during our time together. Also, just a reminder that we are recording this session and after we finish today, a link to the video will be emailed to you and will be available for viewing at davisart.com slash free resources for anyone who might like to watch. So as I mentioned earlier, um, I'm Christy Oliver. I'm the Professional Development Manager at Davis Publications. I'm really thrilled to be here with you all this afternoon. As a former high school art teacher, I'm particularly excited about this session today. Um, I'm also thrilled to have um, Art21 educators and Emma Nordine with us today. Um, Emma, do you wanna say a couple of words before we meet the panelists? Oh, great, yes. Uh, thank you so much to Davis for allowing us to join this session today. And we're so excited to talk about contemporary art in the secondary classroom. Uh, I'm gonna tell you a little bit more about Art21 later on in our session today, uh, but I'll turn it over to our panelists. We'll get started. Elizabeth, do you wanna start by introducing yourself? Um, my name is Elizabeth Deneau. Um, I am a secondary art teacher. I teach all levels of art and also printmaking in a rural school in Marana, Arizona, right outside of Tucson. Um, I have a background in social work, fashion design, pretty much everything. I've worked in nonprofits, um, but teaching is my love and teaching art is my love. And I was really blessed to be a part of last year's Art 21 Educators Cohort. So I'm really happy to be here and talk about, nerd out about art. That's what I like to do. I'm looking forward to nerding out about art too, <laughs> honestly. Uh, I'm Joe Fusaro. I teach uh, high school here in New York and also serve as uh, our 21 senior education advisor. And I'm also um, a proud papa of a dachshund that's barking in the background right now. Uh, hi, I'm Ariana Magat. I am a teacher in Baltimore County, Maryland. Um, I teach photography, all levels of photography. Um, I'm also a managing editor of a magazine called Womanly Magazine um, about health and art and uh, an education. So excited to be here. Thank you. Uh, hi, I'm Ty Talbot. Uh, I live in Seattle and I teach at uh, an independent school named University Prep. And I also teach through an organization called University Beyond Bars, which uh, teaches incarcerated men uh, at one of the state prisons in, um, in Monroe, Washington. And I'm thrilled to be here. I love nerding out. And I like that Joe's picture is bigger than the rest of ours too. <laughs> so what, this is what we have planned for you today. Lots and lots of amazing things. We will start with a panel discussion that will provide a framework for what we mean by contemporary art. Our panelists will address some questions teachers offer, often ask about incorporating contemporary art and practices into your teaching contexts. From there, we'll conduct a question and answer session. Um, so please type any questions you have into the chat box and we will get to them at the allotted time. We'll also provide a quick overview of the various resources provided by both Davis Publications and Art21. And then we will finish up the session today with the panelists sharing their top five contemporary artists to use in your classroom. Um, and now I'm gonna turn it back over to Emma. Thanks, Christy. What a lovely overview. So before we dive into our program today, we thought we would just try to define contemporary art. Uh, for those of you that teach art, you know this is a huge term. I mean, we could really argue this till the cows come home and maybe write a PhD dissertation in the middle, the midst of it. 
Um, but for Art 21, we define contemporary art as the work of artists living in the 21st century. Um, so that's after 2000. Uh, Davis wanted to add on that frequently it pushes the boundaries between genres and experiments with new processes and ways of making, and it distinguishes itself from previous periods when what was happening was contemporary, though it's insightful focus, or sorry, through its insightful focus on personal, cultural, and societal issues like never before. Um, so I'm really excited to talk about this topic today. And to kick us off with thinking about contemporary art in the secondary classroom, I'm going to ask my colleague Joe, who's wearing two hats, both as a high school teacher and also an Art 21 staffer, um, what is the scariest thing about using contemporary art in your classroom? I, thank you, Emma. And, and thanks to everybody that's, uh, that's here. Uh, you know, the, uh, the participants numbers keeps ticking up, so it's nice to see uh, so many people participating. Um, years ago, when I started teaching with contemporary art, the thing that used to be really scary was making sure I knew enough about what I was teaching um, uh, about. Um, what was this artwork about and how did I really want to integrate it in the classroom? Now, today, years later, um, it's more about just being prepared for the kinds of things that will come up in student work when you teach with contemporary art. So long ago, I was trying to get the knowledge base, kind of have the, you know, have the confidence. And today it's more about making sure that, that folks um, know, uh, especially uh, parents and superintendents and principals and all those people know uh, what this stuff is about and why uh, it's important for students to express themselves in certain ways. You know, another thing that that comes up when it comes to, you know, this question about what's scary is, is trying to make connections between what students readily recognize as art, famous painting and sculpture we've all shared in the classroom before, and then also using things like the, the slide that you, the work that you see here by Janine Antoni. Um, you know, students uh, see something like this and they, they may assume, well, it looks sort of like a rope that's laying across the floor and I don't really think that's art. But when they find out, and perhaps you might wind up teaching with Janine's uh, Art 21 segment, when you find out that this rope that she made is really a, a history of her and her family and all of this cloth and wire and things that are twisted together into this rope uh, really are all connected to uh, personal items uh, uh, that, that come from her family, it becomes a, a very different thing. So, you know, it might be scary to have to explain a little bit, uh, you know, give students the context and the backstory so that this stuff makes sense to them and they aren't in the position of just simply saying, well, that doesn't look like anything I've ever seen that we called art before. Um, I do think that one thing, you know, all of us talk about, but I'm sure many of you that are here on the, 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 the call today, like I, I think lots of us want to push boundaries through using contemporary art and, and ask students to, to, you know, think about making work that's more than, you know, just focusing on faces or, you know, observational drawing. We want to, you know, we want to get students to think about more and that can be scary. And then the last thing for me is, um, and I, I referenced this at the beginning, is just, you know, working with content that includes, you know, challenging imagery, uh, ideas, you know, at Art21, we're always uh, advocating that teachers uh, and I'll say it again, uh, preview the videos before you share them with a the class. Um, choose parts of, uh, of the films that we make that really make sense for what you want to teach, but don't surprise yourself by um, being surprised in a way that uh, is not going to work for you. You know, there's lots of, of, of um, film that um, is going to help you teach what you want to teach. And there's also some things that you need to be prepared for if you're going to teach with it in the classroom. And I think that's important for everybody. Um, connected to this last bullet point, content that includes challenging imagery and ideas, I included two student works in the next slide here. And, um, and just to illustrate the example, you know, um, I had a student, uh, Kayla, uh, not that long ago, she was very passionate about um, uh, something here in New York that's uh, was called the tampon tax. And, um, and what she uh, was concerned about is that uh, in New York, tampons were being uh, taxed as a quote unquote luxury item for quite a while. 
And in order to make her statement in the high school, uh, she decided to make tampons literally a luxury item and put them in jewelry boxes and bedazzle them with all kinds of stuff and make them shiny and wonderful and, uh, and install them in the high school. Without context, you know, uh, this, is a, this is a tough one for, for people to look at uh, if they simply see it cold as they walk by in the hallway. But Kayla did such a great job of explaining what this meant. And part of her narrative is on that back wall there in the, in the case in the slide, um, that it was really something that uh, wound up being celebrated in the school in all kinds of different ways. And, uh, and Kayla was really proud of her work. Um, but again, you know, getting around the scary part, she really had to do a good job of explaining what were people looking at. On the right side, a student just a couple of years ago uh, did this beautiful a series of photos that brought family members together from different generations that had never met by sandwiching these negatives together and making photos in black and white of her family, but her family um, um, in a time that never existed, really. Um, and actually, um, it brought up a lot of uh, emotion uh, and a lot, of, a lot of different feelings for Danielle when she was making these photos. And, uh, and I think, uh, you know, this last uh, point I want to make is that students are going to get very passionate about the things that they're making. And at times that can be scary, but it's so worth it. It's so worth getting to that point where students are really excited. And I know all of my colleagues here on the panel would agree. It's so exciting to get to that point where they're really um, um, uh, engaged with what they're making and, and why they're making it. So, um, you know, I guess a natural next question that I wanted to ask my colleague Liz um, is, you know, so what, I don't know, what, what, what does contemporary art allow you to do in the classroom? What, uh, what kinds of things can you do through, you know, using contemporary artists and resources like the ones we're talking about today? Well, I'm glad you asked, Joe. So, um, next slide. <laughs> um, contemporary art allows you to do a lot in the classroom. So in my classroom, the work we look at um, and the artists I feature are all contemporary. Um, if I do teach anything from, you know, what we like to call the classical Western European canon, it's usually through a contemporary artist. Um, it allows me to uh, create an environment where um, kids can foster like dynamic creation and critical thinking. And um, it just really provides a base for them to experiment and also for me to get to know them. So the most notable things for me is one that it provides a gateway for my students to explore important narratives and social justice issues, which is very big for me. Um, it also empowers my students to create work and that's important to them, right? Um, and helps me connect with them in the process. Um, it provides a medium for critical thinking and visual literacy, which I think we all agree as art teachers is really important right now, especially in present day. Um, and it presents new mediums for art making. So I'm gonna talk a little bit about these four things that are like the most important to me. So next slide. Um, okay, so the first one, providing a gateway for students to explore important narratives and social justice issues. So as a culturally responsive art teacher, I know that it's rare that my students see themselves reflected um, in the art room. Usually before they come to me, they've never seen a person of color depicted in their art. Um, and they're doing a lot of school art because um, I'm a freshman teacher and a sophomore teacher, but when they come to me as a freshman, um, most of the time, they only know, if they know any art, it's like Van Gogh and Picasso, right? You ask these kids, hey, who's your favorite artist? And they're like, I like Van Gogh, I like Picasso. Yeah, they're great. Um, but did you know about contemporary artists? Um, so most examples that they've seen, again, is from that Western European canon. It doesn't really, contemporary art, because it's now, and because these artists are so dynamic, they're talking about issues these kids care about. They're talking about them and relatable things in their lives. So um, I have some three examples here of like my students kind of like exploring with those narratives and um, some pretty powerful artists. So the first one over here um, is called How to Be Chicana on the left. Um, the inspiration artist for that was Laura Callahan. And she's an artist that does a lot of like She's an illustrator that does, I, I guess you would call them like feminist genre paintings. 
Um, and they're really fun and they um, are latent with like hidden messages. And they're very critical of consumption and um, just narratives about women. So this student um, really felt like she wanted to represent Chicana lifestyle growing up in the Southwest, which is where we're located. The middle one is um, the inspiration artist is Kehinde Wiley. You might notice the, the patterning that the student kind of adopted. Um, and this is a person, so with Kehinde, it's really great because you can talk about represent representation, narratives, and using that classical art to like kind of flip the script. And so this student was doing portraits of her uh, black and brown friends to provide more representation um, in the school. So she would hang these up. Um, and the last one is inspired by an artist called Patrick Martinez. He does, he's very prolific. He does a lot of different things. And um, he does a lot of neon signs with just messages, which is um, indicative of the area he grew up in in Los Angeles, where you would see a lot of neon signs and bodegas. So he kind of creates these messages. And this student um, used that um, to make a kind of a neon light painting to discuss how she feels underestimated because she is not an extrovert, you know, and, and kind of some things she was going on in with her life. So it's really powerful. They can use their own narratives. They can relate. They can place people of importance in their artwork. Slide. Um, contemporary art um, empowers my students to create work um, important to them, like we just saw, but um, it also helps me learn about them in the process. Because it's easier for my students to find themselves in contemporary works, when they make work, it they're more willing to become vulnerable. It's kind of like a secret message that I'm giving to them. If I show them work, um, so here we did propaganda posters by Shepard Ferry and Fabiana Rodriguez. Um, and if I show them this work that is like, and we watch these videos of artists and these artists are being very vulnerable and very candid about what they're working with, my students automatically start reflecting that. The classroom becomes a safe space. So here we do contemporary um, propaganda posters is what we call them. We hang them around school and the kids get to choose their own social justice issues um, to create work and you can kind of see the different varieties. And I learn about them through this work, which helps me build relationships and create uh, and learn how to support them. Next slide. Um, so it also provides a medium for critical thinking and visual literacy. So um, this is huge, right? Because our students live in a visual world it's all vying for their attention. It's important that we teach them how to examine what they're seeing, uh, question power structures, who's doing this, who's, why do they want my attention? Um, this is like almost critical to, to their development as humans in the technology, the tech age, right? Um, this is huge. So contemporary artists, so many of them are dealing with this and they're, um, creating pathways for discussion. So what you see here is um, a contemporary collage unit that I like to do with um, Ellen Gallagher, who manipulates and uses uh, mixed media to change narratives and create new stories off of old advertisements. So I teach students how to read these advertisements. And then we talk about how you could read them the same sort of things throughout Instagram and all these other things. So it creates this like really great pathway. Um, and then they get the opportunity to distort these narratives and make them their own. So again, creating that personal touch about things that they care about. So here are some examples of what the students have done. And um, the really fun part about uh, Gallagher is she hangs all of her work in a big pile together. And so you can do that with your kids work and it's really impactful, it's very cool. Next slide. And lastly, what's really important, and Joe talked about this a little bit too, is that our students um, generally think high art means paintings, right? They, they think that it's painting, sometimes they might think it's drawing, but they don't really know until they get to us what art can be. Uh, a lot of them, 
can't even imagine using mixed media until I introduce it. They don't know what an installation is, but then they fall in love with it. You know, this larger context and larger playland that they get to be in. So here are some examples of my students just, you know, wiling out with our <laughs> with our in different medias. Um, my one of my students did this amazing sound suit when we did a mixed media unit on Nick Cave and performance art. Um, the middle one is inspired by the great Micheline Thomas and how she uses mixed media to um, to talk about all sorts of things with women and femininity. Um, and then the last one was inspired by Rashid Johnson um, and how he uses um, different materials to talk about familial life and just uh, social issues. So um, yeah, mixed media is amazing. Y giving your kids playtime in the classroom is so important. So there's a lot of things that art, um, contemporary art can do, but now how do we like put that into play? So I'm gonna ask Ari, how do you use Art 21 resources in your curriculum? Thanks, Liz. Um, thanks for sharing those works too. Those, those mixed media pieces are so impressive. It's awesome. Um, so yeah, I definitely want to encourage everyone here to use any contemporary artist that works best for your students and for your classroom. Um, but if you're interested in specifically using Art21 resources, I'm going to give you some tips on the coming slides because there's so much to use on the website. Um, so before I get into the films, I want to start by just mentioning a really like simple way that I first used Art21 resources was by going into the page where all of the season and episode themes are listed out. Um, I think seasons like one through seven, I believe, um, were listed. Every episode was by theme. And these themes are like secret big ideas. Uh, so if you ever want like just a quick list of like a lot of amazing big ideas, which you can integrate in any way into your classes, um, I encourage you to check out just the episode name list from the films. Um, then they switched to doing uh, episodes by city, which can obviously be used in a, in a different way in your classroom. But um, these little themes I've used in two different ways. Uh, the first is just as like a tiny prompt activity. So like I have a bunch of, um, I like printed out the list and cut it up and put all the little papers in a hat. And I would like go around and just let kids like pick a word or two out of the hat. And then that would inspire some sort of like one day or two day project in class. Um, the pictures on the right are examples of students working with this like paper project where I have them take pictures just of paper, but they have to use one of these crazy big words. So like there's a student um, on a computer working on a photo where his word is protest, but he can only photograph a sheet of white paper. Um, the other one is a student doing the word fantasy which she incorporated some glitter, which is like maybe not okay, but I, I guess I let it go this time. <laughs> Um, but you can also, of course, use these words for like a whole unit. I'm sure a lot of you have run like an identity unit before or like a power unit. If you ever want some more ideas, check out those words. Another quick way to use online resources aside from the films or in conjunction with the films is the educator resource, sorry, the educator guides. Um, these are PDFs that are available online um, by season. So you download the whole PDF by the season and then you can go find the page for each specific artist. Um, I included like a little one, which is probably pretty small on your screen, but for um, like Pepo Osorio and Zanelli Maholi from season one and season nine reflect, uh, respectively. Um, one way I use these guides is for discussion questions. There's amazing discussion questions on the guides, um, but also the little artist bios that they include, I find to be pretty succinct and student friendly. So if you're ever looking for like a pretty clear um, artist bio to use with your students, check out the educator guide PDFs for those. Um, if you don't want to like copy and paste off Wikipedia, it might be better to use the educator guides. Um, next slide. So the films, obviously the films are like one of the most amazing resources that Art21 can provide. Um, a couple quick tips. The first one here on the slide is that I encourage you to use subtitles when you play the videos in your classrooms. Um, I teach at a school that has a really large English learner population um, and sorry, English language learner population. And they just benefit, uh, their comprehension is way higher when they're able to see words while hearing them as well. 
but also a lot of these artists are just like speaking at a pretty advanced level sometimes. So honestly, anyone, no matter what level you're teaching could benefit from having subtitles on when you play the videos in your classroom because they throw around some, some big art words here and there and some big ideas um, that they might follow and understand the meaning better if they can read along. Another tip that I forgot to include on here um, is that uh, that you guys also already probably do, but if you include some questions on the screen, like maybe next to the video or on a printout for your students to be keeping in mind questions or prompts while they're watching to sort of direct their thinking. Because again, there's some like big ideas shared and it can go a little like tangent if you let it. Um, so if you wanna like direct your students towards a certain topic, viewing questions are great. Um, so the way that I use videos in my class, um, I do it in two different ways. One, you can include like shorter segments that you excerpt yourself, maybe like two or three minutes from a larger episode um, that introduce or demonstrate or illuminate a specific idea tied to your unit. For example, um, the top two pictures on this slide are from the Piponosorio video. Um, and I use this to teach the concept of symbolism. When I do a unit where I'm introducing symbolism for the first time, we watch this video together, um, then we talk about it after and I ask them to identify like all of the objects that they saw in the picture and what they was possibly mean. Um, he's a great artist to teach symbolism through. I highly recommend this video segment. Um, and then we like move into the project where they get to start to think of objects that might relate back to their own experiences and their own lives from this video. The other way I integrate videos into my classroom is called Popcorn Days. This is vaguely inspired by other Art21 educators that I've gotten to interact with over the last few years who are playing Art21 episodes for students and for faculty and for friends or literally anyone that is not necessarily tied to a learning objective or a unit that you're doing in school. Um, maybe this is just a video where you all like watch it and think about it and talk about it. And then there's no project to do. It's in between units. Um, I call them popcorn days because I was bringing popcorn into school and we would like watch it like a movie together. Um, and then the students started bringing in like cupcakes and stuff and it really just became like a celebration day. And it's, it's just fun to get them excited. What it's secretly doing also is presenting like just new ways of thinking and then getting them to see artists who are doing things that are totally separate from the kind of art that we're making in the classroom. Um, so like Thomas Hirshhorn is the images I included on the bottom, who's using like spaces and like physical events um, to teach that art can doesn't have to look like a painting or doesn't have to look like a um, like a video or whatever. It can be a happening. Um, okay, next slide. Finally, if Art 21 is not available in your school district where I teach Art 21, the website is actually blocked. Um, there's a couple of workarounds that I wanted to suggest for you. Um, the first is that you just screen the videos live during class, either up on your screen or if you're doing virtual learning like we are on a Chrome tab that you just have your students watch live during class. The second is that on YouTube there are um, segments, there are not full episodes available on YouTube, though I was told they're available on PBS's website, which Emma is nodding, so great. Um, but you can find the clips for the extended play or New York up close segments, which are awesome. You just might have to dig a little deeper to find the correct YouTube clip you're looking for. And then you can either send your kids a YouTube link or you could embed it into whatever platform you use like Schoology or VoiceThread or whatever. And finally, the last thing is to ask your school librarian or media specialist. They'll probably be thrilled if you ask them. You might have a way to access Art21 that you don't even know about. For example, I just learned this year that all of the episodes are available on this streaming platform called Safari Montage that we have. Um, and they also literally might have like DVDs or VHS copies for you if that is more accessible for you in your classroom. So those are some tips. It looks like Emma just threw the link to PBS in the chat. So that's helpful for you. Um, and I'll pass it off to Ty now. So the question I have for you, Ty, is what does success look like for our students? Um, first of all, I, I love the idea of, of teachers getting VHS tapes of the Art 21 series to show. Um, also, shout out to Joe, because he, Joe, you've written the bulk of those teacher guides, right? Um, a bunch. Uh, it's been fun, but this this past season it was really it was it was even more fun to work with Emma uh, on season ten. Oh, that's sweet. Thanks, Joe. 
another thing that I was going to say about the art 21 website is there's really a great search function on it. So like I was doing a project earlier this year on masks and I was kind of racking my brain of like artists um, who'd use masks or disguise in one way or another. So I was searching for masks, disguise, costume, and, and it was kind of, you know, not only do you get videos uh, that pop up, but you get articles that other Art21 educators may have written or things like that. So it's another cool thing. I, can um, I add one thing here? What's that? Can I add one thing here? I just, you know, another thing that, that folks might run into <clears throat> on the Art21 site is that, you know, it can be daunting because there are so many artists on the site. So for those of you who are not uh, too familiar with Art21's website, another great thing that you can do when you're poking around and trying to figure out maybe what artists and films you might want to teach with is go to the playlists. Um, there are some great playlists, uh, groupings of films that have been developed with a, a core question or a theme or an idea. And that's an easy way to become familiar with uh, a group of artists that all talk about something similar. Sorry, I just wanted to inject that because I thought it was yeah, that's right great. After this presentation. Um, I think for me, um, teaching with contemporary art has been really helpful in thinking about what's successful for students. Um, and a lot of what I would say has already been said by my colleagues, but um, I think contemporary art offers students a, a real non-traditional way from making, which opens up a lot of room for playfulness and experimentation. Liz sort of talked about that with, with mixed media. And to that end, I like showing them artists like Yoko Ono, William Kentridge, John Baldessari. There's a great John Baldessari video. It's not an Art 21 one, but um, Tom Waits narrates it. It's very funny. And it, and it gets at that sort of playfulness that I hope for with my students. Um, Thomas Hirshhorn's a great artist to show. He's got a whole segment about like energy, yes, quality, no, you know? And occasionally that's really liberating for a student to just be like, it doesn't have to look perfect, um, but maybe there's energy or idea or enthusiasm behind it. That's a gateway into some other ways of success for students. Um, one of our colleagues, Jack Watson, wrote an article about bad art and how he did a whole thing about, like he wanted his students to spend a week making just terrible, terrible stuff. and and that led them in these really interesting paths. So taking risks, making mistakes, trying different things, all of those contemporary art really offers a, a window into. Okay. Um, I'm really into like process and letting students play with process, which has made teaching from home really frustrating. Um, but here's some student examples. We did a project about how to draw with something that wasn't a traditional drawing tool. So it was drawing with a machine. Um, so you've got a student drawing with light, another one who put like a Sharpie and a blue pen into a drill. And then probably my favorite was a student who drew a stapler uh, with a stapler, which I like the meta aspect of that. All right, next. Um, I think one of the things that you'll hear a lot of folks associated with Art21 educators talk about is the idea of teaching with big questions. Um, you'd probably, to an educator, find that Latoya Ruby Fraser is one of our favorite artists because she asks huge questions about racial and environmental justice, um, family, history, like where do you see yourself in, in the American landscape? Um, and her ways of making are everything from, you know, photography and video to writing to performance. And it's like she just takes it, a big idea and a big question and follows it. Uh, she follows her instinct in a really beautiful way. Um, and I think asking big questions of students allows them to find their voice. You know, that's what young people are thinking about is like, how do I tell my story? And asking them big questions, a lot of the time you get big responses, you know, and a lot of those big responses have a lot of critical thinking behind them, either around personal issues or social issues or psychological issues, uh, things like that. Okay, next. Okay, uh, in thinking about big questions, uh, this was a project that my students did back in 2017. It was kind of in response to uh, Colin Kaepernick's uh, protest during that NFL football season and then the president's you know, vocal responses to that. Um, and I just asked students like, what does the flag mean to you? And what do you think America stands for? And you know, it was right around that time that there was the shooting at the Jason Aldean concert in Las Vegas, so a student responded with a commentary about gun violence and another student looked at the influence of media and Hollywood and sort of how 
how in America we see ourselves through all these really, you know, manufactured lenses in the media. Uh, okay, next. I feel like I'm hurrying because I want to leave room for questions. Um, even thinking about something like self-portraiture, which, you know, I'm sure a lot of us as secondary educators in art have thought about. And um, I try to even frame, you know, self-portrait questions around, you know, how do you see yourself in the world? You know, how do you think other people see you? And so rather than just being about representation, how do you push students to represent, represent themselves beyond just a standard pictorial way? Okay, uh, go ahead and do next. Um, I also really like challenging students to use text in their work, which I think it can be a slippery slope and sometimes um, the work might not turn out being uh, as beautiful as you hope it might be. But sometimes like those pieces that Liz showed, those protest posters, text can be really empowering for students and really offer them uh, a direct way to respond to big questions um, visually. Um, and so I like to show them artists like Glenn Ligon, uh, Barbara Kruger, uh, Jenny Holzer, like they're great artists who use text in a really, really thoughtful way. Um, and this was a student who was kind of checked out in a lot of ways. And I had this project where, you know, it was pretty open ended to create a text based piece around a social issue. And I'd, I'd shown students a piece about Glenn Ligon and she grabbed a pile of stencils, some hot pink paint and started writing these statements that young women hear, you know, and you know, you take one of them out of context, like have a plan and it doesn't mean anything, but you combine it with 20 other statements and it paints a really, really chilling picture. Okay, next. Um, yeah, Liz talked about, you know, students seeing themselves in the curriculum. And I think that's a huge point of success for students. If you show them contemporary artists, they're like, oh, that person looks like me, or they think like me, or there's some part of their identity that I, I can identify with. You get enormous buy-in from students in that. And, and I'd strongly, uh, Ari talked about the, the New York Close-Up series, which focuses on artists who are earlier in their career. They tend to be younger. Uh, they tend to be sort of just a, a, a more diverse set of people. Um, and I think I use those a lot because students really relate to, to those younger artists. Um, I think thinking about critical thinking and big questions is, is really huge. Like this image of Mary Mattingly dragging her stuff down the streets of New York. I think, you know, when students see things like that, they're like, what is that? That, that flies in the face of, of what I think art should be or what I've always been told it is. Um, but it creates an interesting starting point for sure. So, okay, next. Um, I guess another thing I would just add here at the end is that I think teaching from home, um, I've found that teaching with contemporary art has fit really well. I mean, as much as teaching from home is a complete drag, um, there's ways where, you know, if a kid walks into your classroom, they see paint and pens and canvas and pencils and all those things. And the assumption is you're going to make those, make those the, the source of your making, right? Those are the materials you're going to use. Students at home might not have access to all that stuff. We might be able to send them things or they can pick things up or whatever. But there's ways that you can get them making that are in an untraditional way. And I, I've, I've, that's one of the it's on the short list of things that I've liked about teaching from home. Um, you know, I think process and formative feedback are so huge in, in teaching with contemporary art. And that is something that's really, really challenging right now. Um, but I do hope that contemporary art provides a way for students to see a way of making successfully that isn't done in the traditional format. All right, uh, I think it's my turn to ask. I'll, I'll kick this back to Joe. Um, what do you hope students will walk away with as they complete our classes? You know, I and I think um, I think we're all gonna like weigh in on this here. But you know, like the thing that strikes me right away is I I hope students walk away with the sense of possibility, like that that art and art class, uh, and um, they 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 realize that it's more than what they thought coming in. There's, uh, there's more possibility for making things that say something strong. So I guess, you know, you know, before asking you guys, like, 
I, I think I'd like them to walk away with an evolving idea of what art can be and what it can do. Um, and, and give them examples where artists have changed people's minds and have, uh, um, you know, actually um, affected change in some way. So that's, that's sort of at the top of my list. What, what, about, what about you guys? Liz, do you want to weigh in on this too? I mean, I totally agree with that. My uh, biggest hope is that they feel empowered and they feel successful. We have a lot of students that come through our programs that aren't, you know, they don't draw on hyper-realism. They come in thinking that they are not artists. It's so cool to see a student when you're messing around with installation and mixed media and all this stuff, find their medium and realize it's a valid, special, amazing medium that is not traditional. It's not a painting. It's not, um, it's not drawing or it's weird drawing, you know, um, it's your comic books, like them seeing Trent and Doyle, you know, like just yeah. this whole series. It's just so success, like them having success. Cause we know in the art room, like a lot of times we might be the only class that they feel like they're having success in and that they're empowered and definitely that they can change people's minds. They can change the world if they want to, or just, you know, make people think about things. Yeah. Finding their medium is such a good point. You know, yeah. when everybody in the class is not all using markers and, you know, stippling or something, I, they, <laughs> they, you know, and they're able to find stuff that works for them because they want to express an idea in a certain way. Um, and yeah, I, I agree with Ty, there's potential for that in this, a lot of the remote teaching that we're doing. Um, Ari, what do you think? Um, one of the things I want my students to walk away with after taking my class is an interest in, in I guess, in, in visual literacy or in media literacy, depending on like what realm you want to think about it in. I want them to be able to be interested enough to want to find out the meaning behind anything. Uh, I guess this could be like a visual that they see like on TV or on their social media platforms, not just art, not just art in museums, but but any sort of visual or piece of media that they see. I want them to be thinking like, what did the creator intend? Um, what is it actually communicating? Like, what are you receiving? What kind of information? Just the interest in like getting to know about what the intended communication was in any piece of any visual, anything. Um, another thing that I want them to leave with is an interest in diving deep into a subject. Um, this something that like contemporary art has really opened up for me is like the idea that like being obsessed with a topic is like a key marker of an artist <laughs> and like the interest in continuing to to deal with a single topic over a long amount of time or like deep research into a topic um, is creative thinking and is artistic thinking and to make them want to do that. Yeah I mean if we can get students to make cool things that's that's some level of success, but if they're making cool things because they're thinking, you know, mm -hmm. about big ideas, then it, the work changes. At least that's been my experience, and I think lots of people would agree there. Ta and it's the basis of doing anything afterward other than art. Anything yep. that they go on to do, as long as they have this like obsession, yep. that I think can be practiced in the art room and in yeah. secondary. That level of engagement and, mm -hmm. and thinking. Ty, what what's uh, what do you think? Yeah, I mean, Ari, a lot of what you said is what I have written here. And I think that's why I go back to Latoya Ruby Frazier a lot is like, she kind of starts with a hunch about something. Mm -hmm. It's like, I've got a notion about something that I can't let go of. You know, there's, there's that little piece of sand, you know, that becomes a pearl. And, you know, if I can get my students at all sort of like, I have a hunch, I'm scared to follow it and getting past that scared to follow it and then pursuing it and digging deeper and digging deeper and thinking beyond just art even into more of an interdisciplinary way of, of thinking and making, you know, and she's so good at thinking about history and sociology and how those things all come together in a way to tell just such a, a powerful narrative. And if students even catch a glimpse of that, I think that's that's really successful. Mm -hmm. So I guess we can go to the next slide here. Is that all right? Here we go. 
Great. So we have some time for Q&A and um, looks like there's some really amazing questions coming in in the chat. So just a reminder that if you have a question or um, something that you'd like the panelists to address, you can either use the Q&A button at the bottom of the screen or you can type it directly into the chat. And I will start off by asking um, for Elizabeth and all, how are you managing mixed media work in the classroom during COVID? Um, are you having students work at home with found objects? Um, so yes, the answer to that is yes. Um, my school is actually hybrid right now. So um, I do have students um, in the classroom and uh, so I'm kind of a collector and people know that. So they, you know, if somebody passes in their family, I get these big bins of like just weird stuff and I don't throw it away. Um, and uh, so it, online, my students that choose to stay home instead of being hybrid, um, a lot of times I encourage them to use found objects. We talk about found objects. We look at artists who use found objects in their work like Rashid Johnson. And, um, and how we can create multiple meanings for that and what we can do to distort those objects to make um, a different story, a different narrative, a different idea. Um, and nothing is off limits. So, um, so yeah, I have students that have done amazing things with like gravel during this pandemic, you know, um, and kind of getting them to think outside of that. I find though, like when you tell a student, oh, you're gonna make something, it's not gonna be a painting and you're gonna make it with mixed media. You really do need those contemporary artists to give them ideas, to give them that little thread, which is what Art 21 artists do. So they give them these ideas of like, oh, this can be this, it doesn't have to. So um, in the beginning, I might have done that. And then like, here, just use all these supplies and make something. And they just like stare at you like, what, what is this? <laughs> you know, where's the paint? So, um, so yeah, having plenty of examples um, and utilizing those resources, uh, contemporary art resources, finding really amazing artists um, and encouraging students to manipulate objects, you know, as a form of mixed media. Hopefully that answers your question. Does anyone else want to add on? That was lovely, Liz. Thanks. Just because it's to one person doesn't mean that only one person has to answer, but only if you yeah. feel empowered or you want to. I think I think that students, you know, once they engage more with contemporary art and teachers are are helping them kind of work with it, they'll see that materials have meaning in themselves. So um, that goes a long way towards students perhaps working at home or working with mixed media or working with things that they don't consider art materials. So that's been a part of my experience so far, you know, getting kids to think about, well, what, you know, what's the backstory to that material that you might want to use? Or, you know, it, you have this particular idea, what kinds of materials might help you illustrate this idea that isn't necessarily paint or charcoal or clay? And um, and it's a it's a really it, it's a it's a really beautiful kind of learning arc for kids to go through, and you'll you'll it's not I mean Ty said I think we've all said it at one point or another, it may not be pretty in the beginning, it may not be something you want to hang on the fridge right away, um, but it is something that is telling a story that's important to the student who's making it, and um, and that's that's so worth it. Awesome. Okay, I have another question, um, which I feel like is a logistical one, but important for getting started. Um, Marsha Franklin asks, how do you create rubrics that satisfy administrative academic standards while allowing room for these untraditional processes? I love a rubric question. Thanks, Marsha. Oh, Ty, you unmuted I, you go first. Yeah, I mean, I love rubrics and things like that, but I, you know, I, I tend to, with um, with thinking about grading and assessment, ask you know. I guess I ask myself first, like, what do I want my assessment to really do? Like, what's at stake for me in that assessment, and what's at stake for my school? And 
And I think once I kind of lay that out, I'm like, well, what, what can I get away with within that? You know, <laughs> I, I don't mean to say like, I'm going to hoodwink my school or anything like that, but what's really at stake, you know? And, and, and with that, I try to push those boundaries a lot. I try to make students have, a, you know, give them a lot of agency in how they're assessed such that, you know, they know right from the get go, like, here are the learning objectives for this particular project or, you know, and how are you going to, to meet those in a way that that's going to work best for you. And then beyond that, to have the, the assessment as much as possible within that box, be a conversation with the students, you know, and, and I don't know if that, that sounds a little pie eyed, I guess. So I don't know if that really gets at it, but that's kind of where I start, you know, I, I, grades are horrendous in art. And, and I think if there's a way to undermine them, um, in favor of helping your students be better makers and better thinkers and better creators, then I'm, I'm all for that. So, um, but I'd love to hear somebody else's thoughts on it too. So you have a good way of explaining um, like the portrait unit and like big questions. Do you maybe wanna talk about that and how that can maybe be applied to rubrics? Yeah, I mean, you know, when we make it, it, when we collaborate, and when I say collaborate, I mean the students and myself in a class, when we collaborate to build a, a rubric, I, you know, after an introduction to a particular unit or a particular project, whether it's about making a portrait or doing an installation or whatever it might be, you know, I'll ask students after the introduction, so like, what, what do you think is going to constitute really excellent work in this unit? And I take as many answers as they have, and I try my best to make that the, you know, the four column or the, you know, the highest grade level column on the rubric. And then I add, just to address Marsha's question, then I'll add the stuff that they might not be thinking about or the stuff that I think is important that's missing. That might be tied to national standards, that might be tied to um, other language that I might want them to make sure that they're using, or even something as simple as vocabulary, because that's not, you know, students are not going to raise their hand and say, I think we should make sure we use this vocabulary. So the teacher's got to fill in some of the blanks there. Um, but if the students own it, and they own the rubric, um, you know, and they, they build it with you, um, you're going to have more success. And, um, and that's really the way I approach most of the assessments, you know, unless a rubric is given to me uh, by someone like the college board, you know, I'm making the rubrics with the students so that everybody's literally on the same page. I hope that sort of answered the question, Marcia. Great, I think we can take one more question and then what we'll do is that way we can get to all the content we have and you can hear the top five choices from our panelists and then we will come back at the end and answer a few more. So the question I would like to ask, um, to have this last one here, is what has been your biggest challenge in using or incorporating contemporary art into your classroom and how did you overcome it? Anyone who wants to start? I mean, I'll start. I think my biggest challenge, because the kids get it right away, um, is convincing other adults that this is valid and important, and um, this is where, you know, art should be going. Um, so, and getting them to understand the deep, like, critical thinking that's happening in the art room. I mean, I, as art teachers, we know everybody thinks they ju it's just playtime in our classroom, right? Um, but this next level of stuff that we're doing with contemporary art, you know, in general, a lot of people go to a museum and they don't quite understand contemporary art unless you read like the flag on the wall, right? So it's kind of like recruiting and pr promoting and getting that support and knowing and like getting getting adults to understand why this is important has been my biggest challenge and really all it is uh, the biggest um way i overcome that is student work like i put it up everywhere and then if people are staring at it which they usually are i just i'm talking about it look look at this student do you know what this is about what do you think it's about you know like doing the same stuff i do with my students i do it to like the english teachers you know and giving the students a platform to also talk about their artwork, you know, 
creating a space, like if you have a student art show, having them curate the space and them, you know, be the docents and stuff like that. So that's how it, that's my biggest challenge. Um, a sort of simple answer to this question that I often struggle with is like choosing the artist. With contemporary art, there are just so many choices. Um, and sometimes I can find myself like just going down the rabbit hole of a task that could have taken me five minutes and instead takes me like two hours to pick which artist and which artwork I'm going to use to illuminate a certain idea. Um, and like finding resources, teaching with contemporary art, sometimes the resources just like haven't been made yet. Like it's not Van Gogh, there isn't like a Smithsonian website dedicated to videos about him or whatever. Sometimes Art 21 is the only uh, source of a video um, or there isn't one yet. It's somebody that R21 hasn't covered yet. Um, so finding like good, thoughtful and also student friendly language and videos around contemporary artists can sometimes be a challenge. I, I think for me, the, the hurdle was me, you know, that it was like, am I a real art teacher if my students don't know the difference between Monet and Manet, you know, and and I think once I got to a point where I was like, I don't have to carry through the sort of European narrative of the 17th century through now in order for my students to be artists. You know, I, I think letting go of that was deeply liberating, you know, and, and I don't feel like my students suffer because they they don't know you know, some piece of history about the Rococo, you know, um, and, and, and embracing the now uh, is really liberating, you know, and I, I don't feel beholden to that sort of patriarchal art history in the way that I used to. And that that's huge for me. And I think slowing down. You know, I think that taking the time to actually have good discussions requires work and facilitating a discussion and not, you know, my biggest challenge is not being in a rush or reminding myself to not be in a rush to get to the making, you know, because that's what students often expect. We're gonna come in, we're gonna make things. And I think if it becomes the culture of your classroom that there's a balance or there's a, there's a bit of a balance between making and thinking, the, the thinking and the discussions and the looking is going to inspire really great stuff. But if that part doesn't happen, then you get a lot of knee jerk reactions and stereotypical stuff that you've seen a million times before. And just to add on another challenge that I do have is sometimes accidentally veering back towards skills or materials just because I'm used to it. And, and often sometimes it feels like the kids do feed on that a little bit. And so making a unit around an essential question or something that is not tied to materials and skills can be helpful because you can incorporate materials and skills for sure. But as long as you can have like a target to keep bringing yourself back onto the goal of whatever contemporary art you're using to teach um, is helpful to keep me on track. I, I do think it's also cool to connect contemporary art to traditional artists. You know, we were just in a session with <clears throat> Leonardo Drew last week and somebody asked who his main artistic influence was and it was Jackson Pollock, you know, or you look at Fred Wilson's work with, you know, skewering Picasso or, you know, Liz, you showed Micheline Thomas and she'll reference you know, Manet and works like that. So that, that's kind of a cool way to use contemporary art to be like, oh yeah, and there was this thing too, you know, that, that there is sort of a, uh, an ability to see how commentary works as well. Absolutely. Here, here. Um, well, as Christy explained, we're going to transition and just do a couple of housekeeping wrap up things and then we'll go back to Q&A afterward, just in case folks need to run away at five o'clock for whatever reason. Um, so all of our panelists did such a wonderful job introducing R21 that it feels almost silly for me to talk about it, but I will very briefly uh, and just explain for those of you that don't know R21 that we are a nonprofit organization that has existed for over 20 years. And it's our mission to inspire a more creative world through the work and words of artists. Uh, so we do that through a series of documentary films, including the long running art in the 21st century, um, which Ari talked about, everyone's talked about. Um, and if you haven't seen it, you're very lucky in that just about a month ago, season 10 premiered on PBS in the United States. Uh, and if you're somewhere else in the world, you can watch it on our website. 
Uh, and I really encourage you to check it out. We have three new episodes on London, Beijing, and the borderlands, which is the US-Mexico border. Um, so if I could go to the next slide, Tony. Great, you've already heard from our lovely panelists um, about some of the artists that are featured in our 21 films, uh, but this is a, a further snapshot of them. And I just wanted to point out the real breadth, both in terms of their own backgrounds, um, where they come from in the world, the languages they speak, and also what they're making. So if you're doing a unit on, you know, ceramics or sculpture or painting, drawing, performance art, you name it, there's somebody for you and you should check out all of the artists that have been featured so far. And can you go to the next one, Tony? Great. Uh, I encourage you to spend some time on our website and check out all of our educational offerings in depth. Um, but two that I'll highlight now, one are our newsletters. If you wanna learn more about our 21 or just stay in the loop about more programs like this one, please sign up. Um, and you'll get notified instantly when you can sign up. Uh, and the second one that I'll highlight is our 21 educators. All of our panelists today are alumni of that program and we are so honored and lucky to have them, um, one, that they wanted to do the program and two, that they continue to be actively involved. So if you're interested in really infusing your practice with contemporary art, I encourage you to check out that program. Uh, that application should be up in January and closes in March. So please check out our website. So Tony, you can go to the next one. And I'll turn it over to Christy. Great. Thanks, Emma. So since we have Joe with us today, um, I wanted to take a minute to highlight some of the connections between the topics we've been sharing today and the content of the book he co-authored, um, The Visual Experience Fourth Edition, which is um, the textbook for the high school level put out by Davis Publications. Um, as a former high school art teacher, I was so, so, so excited to see the revision of this book. It just came out this past March, so it's brand new, and it has lots and lots and lots of interesting contemporary art um, created by artists that are diverse and inclusive. So there's like a real nice breath included in this book. There's even a whole chapter on media arts, which is really, really great. Um, there's so many interesting ways for students to engage with the works featured in the book, um, including a section in the teacher's edition that provides tips for other ways to engage with art. Um, and there's a lot of support um, in the teacher edition for, di for differentiating um, built in, whether it's offering variety of ways to engage or how to support choice or our English learners or Spanish speakers. Um, Joe, is there anything that you want to, you'd like to highlight, or will you tell us a little bit of the features that you're most excited about? Um, it, first of all, I, I just thank you folks for inviting me to, to pitch in on this book. It was really, it was a fun experience. I've seen previous editions before, um, and, you know, some of you who are, who are in on this webinar, you know, you may be thinking, like, I, I don't need a art textbook, you know, I've, I'm doing just fine. Um, but just like the Art 21 resources we were talking about before, there are things that, um, it, you know, in this particular edition that will, will enhance your teaching. There are examples of pretty much everything we just talked about scattered throughout this book. Um, I'm excited about the art that's featured in this edition. You know, um, folks at Davis were very patient with me and the million questions I asked along the way about what kinds of pictures you know, Christy's shaking her head. She knows from the folks there that I ask a lot of questions. Um, yeah. And, you know, I think there's some just some great examples that can make your life a little bit easier if you don't quote unquote need a textbook. Um, but then again, there's also lots of places around the country where, you know, they don't have a certified art teacher. And, and this uh, particular book is a, is a great starting point for uh, guiding your kids through uh, thinking about some of the things that we've we've talked about today, so I'm I'm excited about the, you know, uh, lots of the studio lessons that are uh, part of this book now, and and especially the art that is included in this book now, and um and just you know pushing it further to include more contemporary artists and contemporary thinking. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I totally agree. If you haven't checked it out, um, please do that. There's lots of really engaging studio um, studio prompts. Um, it does come in a digital edition as well as a print edition. There's um, student and teacher accounts that you can access and you can also get it for 90 days um, 
free of charge if you want to do a preview and you can sign up for that at davisart.com slash free resources and if you'd like to know more about the visual experience specifically you can visit davisart.com slash tve for the visual experience um i we also want to tell you that if you haven't if looked at School Arts Magazine lately, you definitely should. It is the first publication that Davis came out with in 1901. And every single issue has a feature in its centerfold called Contemporary Art in Context, which features a contemporary, an interview with a contemporary artist, along with biographical and contextual information about the artist and the works presented, um, and ideas and prompts for studio making afterwards. So it's really great, you could share it with your students, you can use it as a resource for yourself. You can um, head over to our website, schoolartsmagazine.com, and you can read it for free online, which is also really awesome. Or you can sign up for a um, print uh, mailing of that as well. And now, without further ado, we'll hear from our fabulous panelists who will each share their top five choices of contemporary artists to use in their classroom. All right, well, I'll be brief here because we're uh, running short on time and folks might have more questions. Um, uh, uh, my, my top five involved Jordan Castile, who just recently did uh, cover for uh, Vogue, uh, along with, uh, I believe, Carrie James Marshall. Am I right there? Yeah. Uh, Janine Antoni uh, was uh, featured in one of the slides that I showed you early in this presentation. Uh, Nick Cave, the artist, not the singer. Uh, is one of my favorites to teach with, uh, especially when it comes to students who um, uh, enjoy performing and the performative aspect of contemporary art. Spencer Finch is not an Art 21 artist. I wish he was, but Spencer Finch, um, I love teaching with Spencer because uh, color and, um, and the manipulation of color is really uh, beautifully done in all kinds of ways. And we also mentioned earlier Latoya Ruby Frazier, who, um, who is just an amazing photographer that uh, my students and so many students identify with, not just what she's thinking about, but also what she's experienced um, as, uh, as a, a young person growing up uh, and, and becoming an artist over time. This was really hard because there's so many artists. <laughs> I don't know if everybody else had a really hard time. So I also picked Nick Cave. Um, <laughs> my kids love making, uh, they love dealing with persona and armor. And if you've got cosplay kids in your classroom, I've noticed that they go all in on Nick Cave units. Um, they love sound suits. Ellen Gallagher, um, I showed you some examples of uh, manipulating media um, using mix and collage. Um, she's great. Uh, the most powerful artist that I use, and usually she's somebody I reserve for my AP students, is Kara Walker. And I highly suggest um, the R21 video about the Miraculous Sugar Baby um, or A Subtlety. It is really impactful and it shows the entire process, especially if you're an AP teacher and you're dealing with the new sustained investigation kind of framework. She goes through the entire thing and um, it's really powerful and it's beautiful. Um, Patrick Martinez is not an Art 21 artist. Um, maybe soon, I don't know, he's amazing. Um, he uh, really speaks about being multicultural, being um, biracial and from a, bu a bunch of like different Chicano Latinx backgrounds. Um, and uh, he does amazing work and it's just all across the board. He does these crazy paintings and even um, a lot of references to old like Mexican marts and bodegas and stuff like that. That's really great. And um, the last one that's really impactful in my class is Chinupa Hanska Luger, who is from the Sioux Reservation. And he is an amazing artist, also incredibly prolific, does a lot of 3D work. Um, he does space work and he does like, um, environmental work and he does collaborative work with like people. He was the man who created, well, he didn't originally create, but he created um, during the Sioux um, protests over the water and that area, he created and taught people how to make the mirror shields to, um, to use against uh, the police and, and, and other aggression. 
Um, so check him out. He's amazing. Um, I usually use his stereotype unit, which is really great, talking about the misconceptions of the Native American. He's wonderful. All right. Um, I, yeah, a lot of the artists that y'all have talked about are ones that I love. Um, I always love showing um, Doho Sa, uh, particularly his short about, uh, he calls it rubbing loving. Um, in which he basically does a does a rubbing drawing of an apartment that he's lived in for a, a good long time, and it's very thoughtful, deep dive, beautiful, sweet, loving. You know, it's just it, it has so much in it that I connect to personally, and just I, I love that piece. Um, I've already talked about how much I respect. Latoya Ruby Frazier's work. There's an artist named Chantel Martin, who's who's not an Art 21 artist, but she, um, you know, we, somebody mentioned like, what if you just have a kid with paper and pencil, you know? And she's an artist who basically is like, give her a Sharpie and a white surface and she transforms it into something magical. Like I love her work and students love it too. There's a piece that she did with uh, Kendrick Lamar that's kind of fun for students too. Um, I always show the Creative Growth Art Center, um, and then at the end of it, I debate whether I should let my students know that I have been crying uh, the whole time I've been watching it. <laughs> and sometimes I pretend that I haven't, and sometimes I let them know and use it as a point of vulnerability. Um, Oliver Herring's like a longtime favorite for uh, Arts 21 educators. He loves education and participation and 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 is is so kind of like open to different ways of creating um i really love his work and and i i used him as an exemplar artist uh last spring we did kind of he's known for this his task parties where you pull a task out of a box and you do it it's kind of like an art happening and we did sort of an online version of that 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 i really i really liked i thought it uh, it was it was fun so Um, okay, my first artist, uh, Graciela Iturbide, is an Art 21 artist. Um, I, I teach photo, as I mentioned earlier, and I feel like uh, Iturbide has a photo project for like whatever you're trying to teach. So I, she's like a catch-all photographer that I use throughout the year. Um, Pepo and Osorio, I mentioned earlier around symbolism. Um, going to, again, mention Latoya Ruby Frazier. This is, I think, like the third mention of her um, for teaching about taking image, taking photos of home or family or like locations in general. Um, she's also from Pennsylvania, which is like sort of near Baltimore. Like she's from a place that feels almost local when I'm teaching them. Um, Tyler Mitchell is not an Art 21 artist, but is a contemporary artist uh, who just had a book called I Can Make You Feel Good. Um, and he takes images that my students love and I love. And I feel like they're really fun and colorful and youthful. And there's a lot of easy ways for students to connect to them. Also, if you're trying to teach like formal principles, he's a great artist to just teach some regular old elements of art or principles of design through. Um, and then finally, Alex Webb and Rebecca Norris Webb are two, they're a married couple of photographers. Um, these are not R21 artists, but they're my personal favorites and they uh, take pictures and write. And so it's a really nice combination of like poetry and photographic images combined and showing students that you don't have to choose one medium. You can combine, you can collaborate, you can make works as a pair or on your own. Um, so those are mine. Great, thank you everyone. That was awesome. Such amazing artists to look at. Um, I'm always excited to hear you all talk about what your favorites are and I can't wait to go and look up the ones I'm not familiar with. So thank you so much for that. Um, I wanna also just take a moment to remind everyone that we have some really, really great resources for you from both Davis and Art21. So if you head over to davisart.com slash free resources, you'll be able to sign up for our upcoming webinars. You can sign up for a free trial of the Davis Digital Platform, which includes all of our um, eBooks. You can access professional development sessions, read School Arts Magazine online, and view some of our on-demand video lessons. We've also put together some really great resources on equity, diversity, and inclusion, as well as teaching art online. And please, please, please head over to art21.org slash educators to check out all of the wonderful resources there. Um, they are just amazing, and I'm sure you'll find some really wonderful segments and resources to use in your classroom.
Um, please watch our social channels um, for announcements about our upcoming webinars. The next session we have co-sponsored with ART21 will be on December 9th at 4 p.m. Eastern time. We will have Joe Fusaro back with us again, along with Amber Arnold from Atlanta, Georgia, um, Jennifer Bockerman from Lincoln, Nebraska, and Alex um, Mendes from Chicago, Illinois. They will be speaking about the various ways they incorporate contemporary art into middle school um, teaching. So please check us out for that. Join us for that session and definitely share with any middle school teachers that you know. A special thanks to Emma Nordine and Art21 for working with us to provide these webinars for you. And to our panelists, Elizabeth, Ari, Ty, and Joe, thank you so very much for sharing with us today. We really appreciate your time and your insight. And thanks to everyone who joined us today. We really hope that you found this session inspiring and insightful. And you have had so many wonderful, great um, questions that we are going to stay on for just a few quick minutes longer to answer anything that's burning that you really just need to have an answer to right now. We will stop recording at this point. And as always, we hope that you all stay safe and healthy. And we hope to see you again on our webinars very soon. So thank you. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs>